The last goal Patrick Waugh would ever allow would be as dramatic as any of the most memorable moments of his career. 325 into overtime of Game 7 of the first round, on April 22, 2003, Andrew Brunette eliminated the Colorado Avalanche. Shortly into the 2003 offseason, Patrick Waugh would announce his retirement, bookending the career of one of the greatest goalies of all time, quite possibly THE greatest. Undeniably a massive piece of Colorado's success at the turn of the millennium, how to replace Waugh was only one of the many questions facing the Avs in the 2004 season. Joe Sackick was going to be 34 next season, Forsberg was 30, Rob Blake was 34, top-end talent like Milan Heyduk and Alex Tangay were in their prime, but trusting them to carry a team like the aforementioned superstars just wasn't in the cards. Plus, familiar teams were apparently handling the impending twilight of their superstars with greater success, and if they were going to win their 10th consecutive division crown, much less win the Stanley Cup with generational talent, they had to load up again especially if the shock of the first round loss to Minnesota was any indication. So, they did what any contender would do, and settled for only the best. But it's easy to forget who they chose. Way back when, when papers would list save percentages to the sixth decimal place, and you paid 25 cents for live proto-tweet updates via text, the Colorado Avalanche dipped their toes just a little further into NHL history. On July 3rd, 2003, the Avalanche signed Hall of Famers Paul Correa and Teemu Solani to one-year contracts. The two who had made magic for the Anaheim Ducks for most of the 90s were reunited on the powerhouse winning Avalanche that was already brimming with talent. And they joined this team together for one purpose only. Neither signing went over well with their former teams, particularly in Correa's case, having come off the mother of all Cinderella runs with Anaheim in the 03 playoffs but the stage was nonetheless set. Forsberg and Tangay re-signed to one-year deals very late, all things considered, but with a projected top six that would combine for over 6,600 points in their total careers, the Avalanche looked to be a team that could do anything. But a team that can do anything has a bar implicitly set for them, an unspoken standard that they better deliver everything. The signing of Korea and Salani comes at a very unique time in NHL history. Obviously, there was an impending work stoppage as the 1995 collective bargaining agreement with the NHL and the NHL Players Association was expiring that year, and not many people were hopeful that it would be pleasantly resolved. The centerpiece to the debate was the implementation of a salary cap, which the union was unilaterally opposed to. So, when superstars take team-friendly pay-cut contracts immediately before discussions, that's not going to help their case. There was some speculation that some players who were inclined towards union goonery would let Solani and Korea have it on the ice. We'll see. Of course, as history in the public mind often goes, a lot of stuff gets forgotten, misremembered, or exaggerated over time. And the avalanches I've painted them thus far are incomplete. First of all, GM Pierre Lacroix traded for third-line center Andre Nikolishin and top four D-man Carlos Scrastinch early in the offseason. Both were solid pickups, particularly Scrastinch. Nearly a month later, he sent Eric Messier and Vaclav Nedaros to the Panthers for fearsome enforcer Peter Worrell, and a second round pick in the 04 draft. Not a bad return. Worrell's name isn't thrown around that much, but while he was in the league, he was fearsome. With over 1,500 penalty minutes in his career and getting in over 130 fights, he did it all in the fewest games played in NHL history. He was there to beat you, and he would. This year he would have a teammate in Jim Cummins who was 10th on that list. Cummins would start the season as the enforcer, as Worrell unfortunately would tear his ACL before the season began. This is what we call foreshadowing. So that 20-man roster is almost rounded out to start the season, but the initial question around goaltending I haven't answered yet. Well, the solution isn't quite so glamorous as Solani and Korea. The Avalanche tapped last year's backup, David Abisher. At only 25 and having a 917 save percentage in his three years as a backup to that point, many thought he was ready. But everyone knew that he couldn't be Wah, no one could. And he didn't need to be. 
They just needed him to be solid, because the offensive power implicit in the offseason signings would probably offset any amount of goals allowed. Hopefully. The final point, coaching. Bob Hartley, now with the Thrashers, was the Avs coach for their win in 01, but despite his success, was unpopular. Barely above 530-odd games into the 02-03 season, he was fired and replaced by Tony Granato, who went 32-11-4-4. and Zoo wee mama. That is good. Granato was less than two years removed from being a player himself, and had only two months of coaching experience. But the Avs were successful in 2003 under him. Very. And he was well liked by the players, starkly contrasting the alleged micro-coaching, conservative style of Hartley. Liberal coaching presents its own challenges, but to Granato's players, it was a breath of fresh air. Coming into 2004, it was written that Colorado had enough talent that a trained monkey could coach its players. While I do believe that the coaching seldom has a large impact on a team's success, that's not exactly a glowing review of Tony Granato. Time will tell how well he would do. In the preseason, all signs pointed north for the Avalanche. There was high scoring and production from the guys who were supposed to do those things. Korea and Solani were racking up points, and Absher was looking pretty smart between the pipes. But only the real season matters. And it was barreling towards them like a train. Quickly approaching was the October 10th start date, and the very Kamensky in date at that. Colorado's opener would be against the Blackhawks. Those poor saps. They entered the game as a team that was at best fringe playoffs, and they left as glue. Five minutes into the first, Sakic and Solani set up Korea for his first as an Av, and then Korea set up Sakic two minutes later. Korea got his third point of the night on a Blake power play strike, and two more from Milan Heyduk finished off the Blackhawks 5 0. Forsberg had three assists, Sakic had three points, Korea had three points, and Abisher had a 31 save shutout. Oh, and Jim Cummins fought Jason Strudwick, and it was a really good fight. Given all this, all was right in the Colorado Avalanche world. A week into the season, a 2-1 loss to the Blues was the team's only blemish, with their lone goal coming from Paul Correa. David Abisher had allowed only four goals in 170 minutes of game time, and the offense was humming. The glow of the new season was short-lived, though. Two really tough losses to Edmonton and Boston dropped them all of a sudden to a sub-500 team. And that wasn't even the half of it. If you look at the box score, nothing really seems out of place, but afterwards it would come to light that Paul Correa sprained his wrist in a boardside collision in the second period with Nick Boynton. He would be out indefinitely. Not good. He was a point per game player at this point in the season, not to mention a massive loss anyway. But did he need to be replaced immediately? Pierre Lacroix thought he did. The injury necessitated a very early season emergency trade to attempt to fill that hole. Lacroix traded the struggling Bates Battaglia and a first round pick Jonas Johansson to the Capitals for Steve Konowalchuk and a 2004 third. And this may be one of the best emergency trades of the 21st century. The Caps were banking on Johansson becoming a full time NHLer for their impending rebuild and on Battaglia returning to his Hurricanes form. Neither happened. The Avs got a middle six two way left winger with a streaky scoring touch in exchange for what looked to be a first round pick, but really they gave up nothing in the end. The next week saw a return to form, with Connor Walchuk netting his first in a game against the Predators, and a slew of points from rookie John Michael Lyles, fresh out of Michigan State. In the lattermost game, the Avs would host Patrick Waugh Knight and hang the legend's number in the rafters. Fittingly, David Absher would post a 9-2-9 save percentage en route to a 4-2 win over the Calgary Flames. It was undoubtedly a high for Avs fans. Until news came before the next game that now Forsberg would miss significant time due to a groin strain. An even bigger shame because he led the entire league in assists with 11 at that point. One emergency trade early in the season was enough, arguably one too many actually, but either way, none were coming now. Fortunately, Forsberg would return three games later against Phoenix on November 6th, just in time to rack up more points. Newcomer Carlos Skrastinch also potted the OT winner against the Rangers two games prior. Good stuff, stumbling a bit, but they're catching themselves. With Forsberg back in the lineup, the Avalanche really got going. Sorry, did I say they got going? I meant Forsberg hurt his groin again, and this time would be gone for a long, long time. 
Scarily, it came out that whatever was ailing the groin sprain was also affecting his stomach. The best player in the world at the time would have to be shelved for a long while. November 13th. Welcome back, Paul Correa. November 15th. Goodbye, Paul Correa. Colorado's first win since 2001 and an Abisher shutout was marred by Correa re-aggravating his sprained wrist. Once again, the team would have to figure out how to manage without multiple superstars for an extended period of time. Alex Tangay, at least, was lugging the mail, leading the NHL in points. Sakic and Hayduk weren't too far behind, but Salani only had 4 goals and 10 points in 16 games. While Korea was doing well when he was playing, Salani was struggling. Keep an eye on that. Oh, uh, he scored the game winner against his old team the very next game. How inspiring. He also scored an early game winner against the Sharks on November 11th, meaning he scored game winning goals against both of his old teams in the span of a week. Nice. The next month would pass, and the Avalanche would be unable to gain much traction, missing both Korea and Forsberg dearly. Salani would pick up his production, splitting goals and assists across 8 points in those 10 games. Tange slowed a bit to 10, Sakic made do with 15, but despite the top guys pulling their weight, the Avalanche only went 5-2-3, and two and three, allowing 307 shots over that span, the 7th worst of any 10-game stretch that season, and the worst to that point. As you can see, the top six are coming in the very near future. On the last game of those 10, Peter Worrell would return. He's an enforcer, so his impact isn't felt by the score sheet as much as it is teammates. So it's not really a knock on him if I say nothing appeared to change from the outside. But nonetheless, once the 6'6", 235 pound bruiser got back in the lineup, it reminded everyone of just how massive the Avalanche team was. Teams are often characterized as skillful, and in quick succession of that characterization often comes the accusation that physicality is its weak point. Not so for the Avs. In the calamitous final year of the dead puck era, they knew exactly how to put their eggs in every basket going to market. Speaking of skill, waiting in the wings was Paul Correa frothing at the mouth to return, knowing that once his wrist was healed, it was going to be 100%. No transition period after returning, as he says. Ever the consummate professional, all he could talk about when interviewed off ice was the desire to win, a history of which he'd had with former Olympic and junior teammate Joe Sackick. The loaded roster didn't hurt either, but the ice time would have to wait. Having won only three of their last ten games, Colorado tried to turn it around, they went winless in four. They had two wins, two losses, and six ties. While the odd individual performance was worthy of praise, their play was just disheartening. In the two ties to bookend Christmas, they were both outshot and outplayed, sometimes significantly so. But the times were a-changing. Peter Forsberg was finally back in the lineup, and after the team had gone winless in their last five, it wasn't a moment too soon. Going into December 27th, the Avs were 16 and 9 and 7 and 1. They were a 600 team but had won less than half of their games. Pretty dire for such a winning franchise and roster. Up to the new year, the Avalanche were in better shape. Of note is that on New Year's Eve against Calgary, Worrell and one Steve Moore scored their first goals in a 2 to 1 win. 2 to 1 losses were done after this for the Flames in 03. They'd have to get used to them in 04. In Foppa's first 10 games back, he had 15 points. It's like he was never gone. Towards the beginning of those 10, the Avs put together a nice little win streak, though they were still fourth in the Western Conference, the last of which saw Paul Correa at long last return to the lineup. And he scored. It was like he was never gone either. It was around this time that someone was unfortunately missing from the stat sheet. So uncharacteristically so that it resulted in demotion. Temu Solani. While it's true that once Korea returned, Solani was playing with Nico Lishin and Dan Hynote, his ice time had actually been lessened as far back as Christmas. And, spoiler, it would stay low for the rest of the season. Seriously, Temu Solani, the Finnish Flash, Stanley Cup champion, and Hall of Famer, played more than 18 minutes in a game only twice in the remaining 46 games he played that year. He played fewer than 15 minutes 
27 times in those remaining games. I've heard it said that Granado demoted Solani for production issues, but 21 points in 32 games? That's not even close to how rough it could get for him, or would get. The next quartet of games were lovely for everyone except Solani, whose lessened ice time rewarded him with a neck injury. But fortunately, for once it would not be a long-term injury to an Av star, as Solani would be back the next game. Midway through January, Peter Forsberg put up two goals against Dallas, and it was an injury to an Av star, as a re-aggravated groin, which are two awful words to put together, kept him out again. He would only miss four games this time, but good grief. Having gone 7-0 and 0-1 and 0 in their last eight, the Avs, despite all the doom and gloom surrounding half their team's talent, shot all the way up to first place in the league. Bet you didn't see that coming. Something you probably did see coming is Solani's frustration with his deployment, and I feel him. The whole reason he came to Colorado was to be with Korea and win. He's quoted as saying, if you want our chemistry, we have to be played together, which makes sense. But Coach Granado wouldn't bite. Apparently leaving Solani in the dust, the Avs celebrated their new status as the number one team in the league by losing to San Jose, the only goal coming from John Michael Lyles, who I haven't brought up enough. His emergence on the blue line, I might add, had come despite producing quite well in only third pairing minutes for most of the season, but against the last four opponents, his average time on ice went up four minutes. It would hover around 20 for the rest of the season as he got the looks he deserved. The very next game, the Avs put up five on fellow division leader Lightning, winning off a Hayduke penalty shot in extra time. It was his second of the night and 23rd overall, enough for a third place tie in the league. Sakic and Tange were up there as well, the latter tied with one Marcus Nasland. Remember that name. Two days later, Peter Worrell would return to his old franchise and first love, the Florida Panthers. And he fought Darcy Hortichuk on his first shift. Aw, isn't that sweet? Alex Tange also got a hat trick. What is he doing? January 24th. Peter Forsberg returns against Pittsburgh and puts up three points. <laughs> no biggie. Solani would also get his first goal in 10 games, which is the worst kind of good news. After all, he played a non-injury season low nine minutes against Atlanta the prior game. At what point do you start to think that less ice time and fewer goals are a vicious cycle? Seriously. Understandably, this created tension between Granado and the Finnish Flash. After the long weekend, Solani was also a non-factor in 12 minutes of ice time against the Oilers, the fewest of any skater that wasn't named Travis Brigley, Brad Larson, or Chris McAllister. And in prior games, he was only on the ice more than the likes of Jim Cummins and Peter Worrell. Heck, his linemates were Brigley and Connor Walchuk. That's a really, really rough place to be for anyone, let alone a superstar let alone a lonier, someone who had taken a very team-friendly pay cut to play for your privileged team. But Solani, at least publicly, took it like a champ and the pro he is, sticking around after optional skates to work, telling reporters constantly that he was okay with it if the goal was still to win the Stanley Cup, and if that's the reward it brought. In any case, Tony Granato was sending a crystal clear message to Solani. But as I'm sure many of you may be thinking, it probably wasn't the right one. But even though a lot of his lineup choices were odd, like Joe Sackick centering Paul Correa and Steve Moore, what? Even though that was the case, let's not forget, they were first in the league. I suppose you could argue what I do, that players win and coaches don't, but first in the league, man. Results are results are results. In any case, the spotlight would shift to Paul Correa in the coming days, as he would play at the pond for the first time since Game 6 of the last year's Stanley Cup Finals. Anaheim was awful, fourth to last in the Western Conference. But they won, in OT off the stick of Sergei Fedorov, who was actually signed to try and replace some of Korea's production. Hey look, Tamu Solani finally got a goal, his 13th on the season against arch-enemy Detroit. Hey look, Rob Blake's out indefinitely with a hairline fracture. The parade of injuries to the Avs that had fortunately to that point evaded their decor finally came around. And a few rocky games later, Forsberg would be out again. He had 17 goals and 31 assists, 48 points in only 32 games. And there was a good chance those 32 would be the only ones he'd get in the 03-04 season. 
I wasn't a fly on the wall of the Avs locker room, but despite being so high up in the standings, locker room morale and confidence had to have just been completely shot. But interestingly, the unending conga of injuries wouldn't have nearly as much of an impact on the Avs and on the hockey world at large as what transpired a game before. Four points behind the Avalanche for the Northwest Division lead were the Vancouver Canucks, who had been struggling recently. Like the Avs, their team had high expectations but were up and down in meeting them. As the playoff picture was beginning to take shape, more eyes than usual were on games between these two. The game was uneventful really through two periods, but in the final seconds of the second, Canucks captain and leading scorer Marcus Naslund lunged for a puck out of his reach as he was exiting the zone. Did you miss it? Here it is again. This play went unpenalized. I'm really, really hesitant to give my opinion on this hit because it may be the single most debated hit in 21st century hockey. Is it an elbow? No. Is it dumb and unnecessary? Of course. Moore had no intention of playing the puck and made contact with Naslund at a terrible angle, and it should at least be interference. Suspendable? Eh. But as unremarkable of a bad hit as this was, the sheer weight of the voluminous fallout it would incur skewed almost all contemporary analysis of it away from anything objective, and sometimes still does to this day. Canucks coach Mark Crawford let the refs have it after the game. His comments get a lot more colorful than what could make it into clippings like this. Interestingly, while he and GM Brian Burke took the league and referees to task for the actual hit, it seemed like the Canucks players themselves had more of a problem with respect. The idea that a bottom sixer like Steve Moore, who only had double-digit NHL games under his belt, would even think about checking a player of Naslin's caliber, much less in such a vulnerable position, was unheard of to them. Marcus Naslin himself agreed with this sentiment, but also added some very interesting comments. To his eternal credit, he said he didn't feel the hit was dirty, or that Moore intended to injure him. It takes a lot of integrity to not be tribal about that kind of thing, especially when you're sporting over a dozen stitches on your face. Unfortunately, his teammates would not be so tactful. Tough Guy Brad May infamously stated after the game that there was a bounty on Moore's head, and though he was quoting Slapshot, that's the exact kind of poorly thought out statement that could come back to bite you in the long run. And it would. The Avalanche, for their part, didn't have much sympathy for the Canucks' belly aching. After all, they'd been on the receiving end of some pretty brutal stuff in the past four years in dust-ups with Vancouver. It was a rivalry now. With Blake out, and now Adam Foote for one game, John Michael Lyles got a very extended look on the top D pair with Derek Morris, who, again, I've kind of neglected to mention, but he was a very valuable piece of the Avs' blue line. Lyles' nearly 25 minutes played that night were a career high, after this drubbing, the Avalanche fell out of first place in the league, and they never had it again. Despite being a 30-win team, and for nearly two months first in the league, GM Pierre Lacroix thought it was time to make some changes. He sent a third and prospect Chris Bahan to California for defenseman Bob Buchner. He was a physical, defensive defenseman who would be slotting into the third pair immediately, but that means someone was going to be off the Avalanche. And who would that be but Martin Skula, a 24-year-old offensive defenseman who only had one goal in his last 30 games going to the Mighty Ducks for Kurt Sauer. Like Bugner, another defensive defenseman. Interesting. So with that overflow, D-man Brett Clark came out of the lineup. It appeared Lacroix was going to tighten up the Avs defensively, but he wasn't finished yet. Over the next eight games, the Avalanche were severely up and down. Again. Two wins, two ties, an OT loss, and three proper losses. All while Forsberg and Blake were shelved, Super Joe had 12 points in those eight, bringing him to 74 points in 67 games. Really good, but pretty low by his standards due to the team's slump, and also it being 2004. Alex Tange had 11 in those 9, and he was doing slightly better at 77 points. Hayduke had 11 in 8, but beyond that, Connor Walchuk, who was once again promoted to the top 6 with Forsberg out, got no points. 
Paul Correa had one goal in those nine games. Teemu Solani had none. In fact, he had no points at all. John Michael Lyles was a bright spot, believe it or not, going just under a point per game in that stretch and logging almost 20 minutes per. The new arrivals on the blue line were in for some mad whiplash. When they first arrived, Bugner and Sauer played 22 minutes, and in the very next game, played 7 and 16, respectively, as Foote and Blake returned to the lineup. A fateful rematch with the Canucks was scheduled on March 3rd in Denver. Apparently concerned about a blow-up, Commissioner Gary Bettman was in attendance. But again, the now-surging Canucks were one point behind the Avalanche for the division crown. As long as they had a chance to win, they had to play to win. There was one fight, and more than a few penalties, but ultimately the game ended without incident. Or a winner. Ugh. At the end of that week, the Avs got completely manhandled by the Flames. They'd only won two of their last 11, and that run coincides pretty well with Forsberg's absence. Or the sour Bugner trades, depending on how you look at it. They'd look to rebound in a big way against Vancouver, seeing them in their barn for the first time since the Nasland Moore hit. But in the saga of these two teams, that hit would quickly, and terrifyingly, be overshadowed. March 8th, 2004. It was a fairly average game until Brad May and Peter Worrell fought with 13 and a half minutes to go in the first. Off the next faceoff, Steve Moore and Matt Cook fought. And Moore won. Pretty big surprise there. Cook was obviously taking him to task for the hit on Nasland, but was that retribution enough after no supplemental discipline, one uneventful rematch, and half a month? We'll see. Off the very next rush, Heyduk gets his 33rd of the season. Kluche's gotta hate that one. The pace really picked up, but a few minutes later, Connor Walchuk cleaned up a broken play. 2-0. Seconds later, Saka counted down his own rebound to make it 3-0. Seconds later, again, Darby Hendrickson scored a falling goal to make it 4-0. In 51 seconds, the game went from 1-0 to 4-0. Seconds later, again, again, Steve Moore finished some great puck protection by Worrell. 5 nothing in the first period. Blake and Rutu grappled, Worrell muscled May down again, and that was it for one. In an uneventful second period, May got one and heckled Abisher. May got two and heckled Abisher, taking a dumb penalty, and the Avs scored on the power play. Way to go, Brad. With just under four minutes left in the second, Yarko Rutu and Matt Cook blew a 2-on-0, and along with it, any chance the Canucks had, really, of getting back into the game. Early in the third, Korea pounded one past Hedberg shorthanded. 7-2. Sackick added another one in rapid succession. A few minutes later, around eight minutes into the third, Steve Moore stepped out onto the ice for the last time. Sean Pronger roughed him up while he was waiting for a breakout. On said breakout, Bertuzzi hounded him up and down the ice. He grabbed his sweater as he rounded the faceoff dot and came back up into the defensive zone. Grabs his sweater, gives him a whack, and piling on is Andre Nikolic, and everybody's into it. Now we get a line brawl, and Hedberg wants Abisher. Johan Hedberg comes to center, and he invites Abisher, who points to the clock and the score. And the Vancouver trainer comes on quickly, and they need more than just the trainers. They're calling for medical help for Steve Moore. And the score settling has gone too far. Tony Granato and Rick Tockett lit into Mark Crawford, and probably the refs too, knowing full well that all the Canucks' public statements and sentiments had damned them. All Crawford could do was smirk. Steve Moore suffered three fractured vertebrae in his neck, neck ligament tears, brachial plexus nerve damage, facial cuts, and a grade 3 concussion. Though he wouldn't suffer any life-altering injuries and would recover, thankfully, in a few years, he would never play another NHL game. In a different way, this also had an irreversible impact on Todd Bertuzzi's reputation and career, and to a lesser extent Mark Crawford and the Canucks. Nobody would ever look at Todd Bertuzzi the same way again, rightly or wrongly, after this incident. 
A suspension from the NHL was a given, but it was floated around that the law might get involved due to the public comments made by the Canucks that made it appear premeditated. The last great blemish of violence in the NHL, the Marty McSorley incident, saw the former be charged with assault in that same building. As you may have gathered, this event rocked the hockey world to its core in a way very few things have. It's also interesting for analyzing how various media overplay or underplay a traumatic event. Of course, everyone cried the same tired fouls about how the league just didn't care about this kind of thing, or fear-mongering about how a cheap shot would eventually kill another player. Some Vancouver publications jumped instantly to defend Todd Bertuzzi, but many brutally took him to task. For a few days, his fate would hang in the balance, but on the morning of March 11th, the league suspended him for the remainder of the 2004 season, the 2004 playoffs, and overseas for the next season. All in all, he wouldn't play an NHL game for 17 months. The Canucks were slapped with a quarter million fine for negligence and failing to control the whole situation. Brad May became part of a legal proceeding due to his role in claiming beforehand that Steve Moore had a bounty on his head, and Mark Crawford was scrutinized as well for allegedly telling the Canucks during the second intermission that Moore needed to, quote, pay the price. Only the players know for sure, but it definitely seemed like just in the third, out of nowhere, everyone went after Moore. They had been pretty hands-off to that point. But none of them, not even Bertuzzi himself, could have known the retribution would be so violent. But it doesn't matter. I've heard it said that nobody in the hockey world felt worse than Bertuzzi after the incident. But with a broken neck and a finished career, who could have felt worse than Steve Moore? This is the most infamous incident in the 21st century NHL. The build-up, the reaction, and the time to marinate in the public eye during the lockout would make this the lasting image of violence in hockey. The day of the bertuzzi Moore incident was also the eve of the trade deadline, the night of which Colorado acquired Omega Pest Matthew Barnaby. He'd been pretty productive in a bottom six role, with nine points in 13 games for the Avalanche to close out the season, though that's obviously not the primary reason why they got him. But the biggest trade would come the day after. The Avalanche would acquire Chris Gratton and Aussie Vanninen, giving up Derek Morris. They also gave up prospect Keith Ballard, so, yeah, I don't know about this one. Morris was a huge part of the Avs' blue line and power play, allowing them to solidly rotate in two units. Giving him up for a 28-year-old former top three pick who was middle six now, and a 23-year-old top four, again, defensive defenseman, losing Skula and Morris for Vandenen and Bugener removed a lot of skill, but added a lot of toughness. Granted, the Avs didn't need skill, at least not in the forward core, Still, did that trade need to happen? The Avs were 4th in goal differential and 12th in goals against at the trade deadline. Did they need a more stout defense? Eh, only Pierre Lacroix knows for certain. In any case, Vanninen, Gratton, and Barnaby, which is the name of my new bluegrass band, all broke in their maroon and blue on the 10th of March and did okay. The team won, which is conducive to wanting to continue to play for them, Maybe it would work out after all. The victory was especially nice considering how rattled the team likely was in the wake of Steve Moore's injury. Alex Tagay would get an assist, his 54th on the season, getting him to third in league scoring with 79 points. And then his knee exploded and he was out for the rest of the regular season. So, so many things happened to the 2004 Colorado Avalanche, but injuries are the most remembered actor for a reason. Over the next five games, the Avs just couldn't get any daylight between them and their division rivals. In their third straight loss, Aussie Vanden got clubbed over the head by Wade Belak, who would get a whopping eight-game suspension. Somehow, Aussie Vanden would not miss any time. Cherish this moment of non-injury for the 04 Avalanche because it would be about the only one they got. Forsberg would return to the lineup, for good this time, on the same day Steve Moore was released from a Denver hospital. However, in Forsberg's return, the Avs would tie the lowly Blackhawks 2-2, clinching a playoff spot, but in the most deflating and disheartening way. 
In fact, it was so unremarkable that the Edmonton Journal forgot that they even did clinch a playoff spot. And John Michael Lyles was injured. Great. Since the Vanden Morris trade, he was seeing middle pair minutes, but he still had 10 points in his last 10 games. Another tough loss. And the Avalanche still couldn't find ways to win. In a back-to-back -back against Detroit, they managed only one goal against Manny Legacy, and even in their next win against the Kings, potted just two. One of those two was scored by Tay Mussolini, which is good news. The bad news is you haven't heard that name in a long time, because he had not scored a point in his last 20 games. 15 goals, 15 assists, in 75 games played. In case there was any doubt at all, this season was personally a wash for him. However, no one in all of history would remember that or care about it if the Avalanche won the cup. For the entire team, however, they limped towards the end of the regular season, winning only two of their last 10. They ended the season with only 18 goals in those last 10, the fewest of any 10 game stretch that year. The slide was enough for Vancouver to clinch the division crown away from them the day before their last game on April 4th. After all the Avs had been through that season, after all they'd been through against Vancouver, they just weren't consistent enough to nab their 10th straight division crown. And on top of the OT loss to end the regular season, Colorado would get one last serious injury to one of their stars. A high ankle sprain would sideline Paul Correa indefinitely. In the 2003-04 season, he only appeared in 51 games, notching 11 goals and 25 assists for 36 points. That's not bad by any means, but that's not Paul Correa. Still, he could have been Tamu Solani, who was healthy for basically the whole season and only got 32 points in 76 games. But we can't lay blame at their feet beyond their individual play. The entire Avs team was just so up and down that it was mind-boggling. Tangay, who would return for the playoffs, along with Sakic and Hayduk, were the picture of consistency all season. Despite all his injuries, Forsberg played like he was never gone. And finally, one name I've intentionally not mentioned for the majority of this video, David Abisher, who is often slammed as the weak link of the 2004 Avs, had a 924 save percentage with a 209 GAA and almost 23 GSAA. That's pristine. I mean, that's a better save percentage in GSAA than that year's Vesno winner, Martin Brodeur. Abisher wasn't even top 10 in voting, despite being 5th in save percentage and 4th in GSAA among starting goalies. Abisher backstopped the Avalanche in 62 games that season and did really, really well. But nonetheless, 82 games are in the books. Now the real season begins. All will be forgiven and all will be forgotten if the Avs are able to do the thing. 16 wins, that's all they need. Down Paul Korea, they would be playing the fifth place Dallas Stars who are having their own frustrating season in the first round. The Stars were a pretty bad road team in 2004 despite having a good lineup. That would have to play into Colorado's advantage as Game 1 was in Denver, 8 p.m. Mountain Time on Channel 27. An action-packed, physical first few minutes were capped off by Peter Forsberg cashing in on his own deflection rebound. Two minutes later, a nicked-up Alex Tange got a lucky bounce off of Teppo Newman to make it 2-0. After a quiet end to the first period, Abisher shut the door in the second to keep the Avs lead at 2, including a pure reflex save without his stick in the final second of the period. A few minutes into the third, Joe Sackick dominated the universe to make it 3-0. The Stars peppered Abisher in the third, but he held the fort. But a tricky shot from Nico Kapanen got by him with six minutes left. Eh, oh well. The Avalanche took the game 3-1, and aside from that boo-boo by Abisher, it was as good of a start for him and everyone else that they could have asked for. In game two, the Stars didn't have to wait as long to crack Abisher. Turgeon with the beautiful sauce to Madano about eight minutes in. A minute later though, once again, Joe Sackick was left all alone in front to tie it up. In the dying seconds of the first, Rob Blake blasted one on net, deflected in by Alex Tangay. In a tightly played second, the Avs got a gift off of Richard Matvichuk's skate. 
Nicolation would hook up with Hineout shorthanded to put the game out of reach, and Connor Walchuk would make it 5 with a stupid deflection. The Avs, just like that, were up 2-0 on the Stars, outscoring them 8-3. Dallas got one back in Game 3, a wild back-and-forth affair that the Avs had a 3-1 lead in over halfway through regulation. Former Avs Scott Young banked one in with single-digit seconds left in the second, and another weak goal on Abisher tied it very late in the third. Steve Ott, of all people, got the OT winner. It would be easy to lay blame at the feet of David Abisher for weak goals 2 and 3 against, and his general downward trend, but the Avalanche completely disappeared in the back half of the game, reverting to their usual streaky selves at the worst time. But they still had the series lead. In Game 4, the scoring came early and often. Haydu cleaned up yet another unattended rebound in the crease, then Joe Sackick ripped one past Turco shorthanded. On the same power play, Zubov got one past Abisher. That would be the last goal we saw until 8 minutes left in the third, where a bad bounce would fool Abisher again. Headed to overtime, the series was at a crossroads. How the Avalanche would win this game, or lose this game, would answer a lot of questions about how they fared when faced with adversity. But they pulled it off. In the second OT, the third goal was scored by... M Merix Vatos? Who? I don't blame you for not knowing, because the 21-year-old appeared in four games that season. One game he played less than three minutes. He was stuck on the fourth line to start the series, but intermittently was getting shifts with Sakic and Tangay on the top line, and that game-winning goal was his third point of the playoffs. Way to go, kid. Still, though, they needed to close out the Stars. And they just trucked them in Game 5. Dallas scored early, but the Avs completely ran away with the game in the third period, starting with a Forsberg goal less than a minute in. Merrick Svatos had three assists, bringing his point total in five games to six. That is incredible from a 21-year-old getting bottom six minutes. Speaking of production, Sakic and Forsberg led the way as they often do, followed by most of the usual suspects. Solani was notably without a goal and only had two assists. However, he would get one last shot at redemption against the Avalanche's next opponent in the conference semifinals. The Sharks were a prime example of overachieving. Nothing about them on paper seemed like a second seed. Heck, Patrick Marlowe was their leading scorer with 57 points. That's it. They didn't have elite star power, certainly not like the Avalanche did. All they did have was decent talent, pretty good defense, and great seasons from Yevgeny Nabokov and Vesa Toskala. And the prospect of exacting revenge against Hey Mussolini. Don't forget that. Early in the first, they were well on their way. Marlowe and Dompus 1-2 David Abisher early, putting the Avs in a big hole but with a lot of time to spare. For the Sharks to get another. 3-0 after one, though Abisher definitely had a case for goalie interference on that last one. Steve Konowalchuk scored his fourth goal of the playoffs halfway through regulation. And by the way, for a middle six guy, he did a great job of stepping up when needed to for this crippled team. He had 39 points in the regular season. But Marlowe cashed in again on a two-on-one, and that was it. Abisher had a really rough game, and all of the naysayers who knew that he just couldn't be Patrick Waugh suddenly showed themselves again. For Game 2, Alex Tangay slotted back into the lineup after suffering a thigh bruise, hoping to spark the Avs back to a series tie. But a notable name also came out of the lineup. Teemu Solani. Both he and Coach Granado were unsatisfied with his play thus far, and the latter fell back on scratching him. If you were hoping that Solani would eventually break out and prove everyone wrong this season, now seems like a good time to tell you it never happened. Matthew Barnaby set up Haydu to get the Avs on the board first. Good early signs. They really held onto that 1-0 lead for a while, but Vinny Dampu struck back in the back half of the second, and Patrick Marlowe gave the Sharks the lead again in the last seconds of that period and the Sharks would not relinquish that lead. Going back home, the Avs were in an 0-2 do-or-die hole, and they didn't score. They got shut out. In fairness, they owned the game, outshooting San Jose 33-17, and Abisher only allowed one goal, and even that was a funky bounce off the backboards and then off his actual back. While Abisher did take some blame, rightly or wrongly, so did Tony Granado. All of a sudden, Everyone had laser-guided amnesia for how quickly the Avs dispatched Dallas, and was remembering how Granado's Avs lost in the first round last season. 
It was easy at this point to drum up any tidbit about his coaching style and say, aha, you see, that's why they're losing, because he is XYZ as a coach. But they weren't out yet. But we kind of know how this movie ends, don't we? In Game 4, the Avs had the chance to extend the most unique, most hopeful, and yet most inconsistent and disappointing season in their history. And they did. With Rob Blake out injured, Sauer came in. Abisher bailed them out early in the first. Shots were 4-0 Sharks, just three marks in. But beyond that, it was a classically tense and even clutch-and-grab game. Scoreless after 60, who else but Super Joe, one-timing a turnover from his strong side, extended the Avs season. Despite the ear-splitting reaction to the goal, once the dust settled, one couldn't help but feel that all it had done was delay the inevitable. Back at HP Pavilion, the Avs once again extended their season with an OT goal from Joe Sackick, who had scored all three of the team's goals in their two wins. And there were only 40 shots in this game. That's early 2000s hockey in a shell nut, folks. And now with the series score being 3-2, all of a sudden, delaying the inevitable became buying time. Well, Alex Tangay is out again with a lower body injury, but Paul Correa finally returned to the ice for Game 6, in front of the home crowd, the postseason having been survived long enough to get a mulligan from his injuries. But the time for next times, and eventuallys, and mulligans, was over. Dampus broke the goalless tie early in the second, and another two in quick succession put the Avs down three. Nabokov almost made one of the greatest saves I've ever seen, but nonetheless, Hayduk scored. And though he scored, nonetheless, that would be all the Avs would get that night. And their season was over. In the few years leading up to 2004, the Avalanche had lost a lot of familiar faces that had been key parts of their two cup wins. Mike Keane, Greg DeVries, Steve Reinprecht, Eric Messier, Sean Podine, Stefan Yell. Integral. And yet, they weren't stars. They were the right guys in the right places and at the right time. And you could easily argue that the right team wins the cup, not the best one. Although, can we really say that this Avs team had too many good players? I mean, half of them didn't play for half the season. What we did get was guys like Steve Konowalchuk, Marek Zvatos, and John Michael Lyles stepping up to the plate. They're not exactly superstars, especially not at those points in their careers. If it's not a case of cramped skill, is it a case of injuries? Well, plenty of teams go on to playoff glory in spite of injuries. Heck, this team was first in the league for months, even after missing Forsberg and Korea for ages. Is it a question of coaching? Again, same counter-argument. Granado has a great record as the Avs coach and was two wins away from the conference finals. But two wins short is still short. And man games lost are still man games lost. And not good enough is still not good enough. Granado was demoted as the coach of the Avs to assistant, and Joel Quenville was hired for the next season, whenever that would be. The looming threat of the work stoppage became a reality in September, and hopes for an agreement at all died away completely in mid-February. The entire 2004-2005 NHL season was lost. To this day, it remains the only time in American major professional sports history that an entire season was cancelled. So, Quenville and Granado would take the reins as early as 05-06. Peter Forsberg's one-year deal with the Avalanche, with such brief term because of the threat of lockout, expired, and he did not re-sign with the Avalanche. Many thought he was done in the NHL period. Korea and Solani never wore an Av sweater again, and who can really blame them? They came to win, 
and instead had career worst seasons filled with injury, demotion, and a total lack of chemistry. David Abisher, who had performed so admirably that year, would be the starter for only one more season in Colorado before being traded away. This team, which had such a unique history packed into so short a time span, was scattered to the wind. If there is no one answer to the question of how such a skilled team remained so inconsistent, yet won when it didn't matter and lost when it did, maybe their entire season can be summarized thusly. The 2004 Avalanche were a team that could have made anything happen. But instead, everything happened to them.